Uh, thank you everyone for being here. I am here to talk to you about the Ethereum merge. And if you're unaware, I am the CEO of Dasset. Dasset is New Zealand's trading platform for 88 digital assets, soon to be 100. When I first got into Bitcoin in 2013, there was no term for blockchain. In the Bitcoin white paper, there was a phrase chain of blocks, but at the time, the thought process was still evolving. And people started realizing that the technology that came from Bitcoin should actually be defined because by defining it and understanding it, we can look for um, ways to utilize the technology beyond currency. And so at the time, people were trying to identify the difference. And uh, the only way they could really figure out the difference was between Bitcoin and Bitcoin, where there was little b Bitcoin, and that was the unit of account that we can reference today when I say, oh, I'm going to send you 0 0.1 Bitcoin. And then there's big B Bitcoin. And the big B Bitcoin was the underlying network that secured the unit of account. And so it was really challenging trying to build ideas when the industry was still trying to figure out what the heck this technology was. And it wasn't until, I think it was somewhere mid 2013, maybe even towards the end of 2013, uh, that we started seeing this word blockchain emerge. And once that started emerging, the ideas started exploding. And so it's, it really required an evolution in the language that we were using to describe the technology before it became um, something that we could see as a tool beyond money. And that is what enabled the rise of Ethereum. Uh, Vitalik was very much, who is a co-founder of Ethereum, was very much involved in these discussions in 2000. 12, 2013, um, and along with many of the engineers, it was very much a learning discovery and um, uh, educational process because we, uh, a, a lot of the developers, a lot of the people in the industry were building on each other's knowledge on a daily basis. And so new ideas were coming out daily and that was being um, improved daily. And so emerged this idea of having a network that facilitated applications that are known as Turing complete. So if you look at the Bitcoin protocol and the Bitcoin network, what you'll notice is that they call it a dumb network. And that's not an insult. That's to really say that it's, a very simple network that um, is, is enabling it to have a very limited number of functions. And that is a good thing in that uh, it can do one thing and it can do it really, really, really well. Uh, when you look at the core code behind Bitcoin uh, in 2009, you'll see that there were all kinds of other applications in Bitcoin uh, that the founders were trying to implement. So I think there was a, um, a blackjack or a poker game uh, in, in the, the original client. Uh, there was some groundwork for things like uh, decentralized exchange, so uh, e-commerce. And so there, there were definitely other things that the creators of Bitcoin were thinking about uh, in the future and had some of those prototypes or ideas in the original code. 
most of that was completely stripped out of the Bitcoin client um, uh, since then. And um, the programming language on Bitcoin is very rudimentary. And so if you think about logic, uh, when you look at programming languages, you want to have the ability to have a lot of log logic to uh, facilitate users to interact with that software. So the logic that's used for uh, in the software that an entity like Facebook uses is uh, quite extensive. Uh, and you think about things like if and or um, uh, so it's a different uh, um, syntax that enables the software to have a lot more um, uh, variability. And when we look at the Bitcoin um, uh, network and, and Bitcoin uh, programming language, it's, it's very, very, very simple and simplified. And so the creators of Ethereum saw an opportunity to create a network that enabled uh, a robust programming language for um, applications to be developed on that go far beyond the ideas of money and finance. And so um, from day one, Ethereum was an experiment. It had a lot of haters, a lot of people who thought it was going to fail. And a lot of people who thought it was a joke, and I think many of them are Bitcoin maximalists, but um, through the years, you know, even today, uh, Ethereum has received enormous amounts of criticism. For example, having uh, a lot of data, maybe too much data stuck in its network. But I would consider that Ethereum has uh, certainly been a success. And although it's a prototype and although it's reached its limits, we've seen that uh, there is um, opportunity and value in the applications that are being used and being developed on Ethereum. And so what Ethereum enabled us to do is glimpse into the future and see what can be possible. And so from that perspective, I would say that Ethereum has been uh, very successful. However, it also highlighted the issues. There's no, no way that two, three, four billion people can interact with each other using this network. There are fundamental flaws in the Ethereum blockchain that prevents it from mass adoption. And so very early on, almost uh, within two years of launching Ethereum, the engineers were already looking at solutions and ways to evolve Ethereum so that uh, it can adopt with um, the changing times. And so when we look at the numbers today, uh, they're, they're quite staggering. Uh, 20, uh, so about 55, 60% of all trade volume is Bitcoin. The second largest is Ethereum. Back in the day, Ethereum used to be an altcoin. Now, most people say you have Bitcoin, Ethereum, and altcoins. So Ethereum has really come into its own light and uh, has, has really shown that it's not the same as Bitcoin. It's not a currency or a potential to be currency. It's more like a platform, I hate to use this word, but decentralized platform to create censorship resistant applications that run 24 seven to meet our needs. And those needs are everything from supply chain to gaming to um, finance and beyond. So uh, for, for, for what I, I think that if in, the, in 10 years from now, people are going to look back at Ethereum and look at it as 
a major stepping stone for our industry and it really took us to a new level and for all intents and purposes the ethereum that we have today although it is never going to uh it's not going to exist in the future it has conquered it has succeeded in um what it was aimed to do uh but it's also lost a lot of its support from uh developers because um it's old technology ethereum is now considered uh, old technology and uh, something that people are um, really not supporting from a technological level anymore. Um, engineers are looking forward and they're looking for at solutions that are occurring after this merge. So uh, it used to be called Ethereum 2.0, um, used to be called sharding, um, uh, it used to have many different names. And a big reason why is that for the past five years, there's been a lot of research, failure, testing, theory from thousands of engineers around the world to get to where the Ethereum merge is um, next month. And so um, it's been an evolutionary process since day one. There's really been a drastic change in how the infrastructure uh, was perceived four or five years ago compared to how it was perceived last year compared to today. So uh, it's no longer called Ethereum 2.0. I don't even know, you know, is it an Ethereum upgrade? Ethereum merge, uh, we're still evolving our language and, and how to explain and describe what's happening. And part of that is because it's been, um, it's been a moving vehicle since day one. So if you think about Ethereum, one of the challenges we have here is with this merge is that there, it's holding uh, $300 billion in value and running transactions for millions of wallets uh, on a monthly basis. And so um, what we're, it's, it's undergoing, you can kind of think of it as an analogy of a rocket ship that's going to the moon. And while it's going to the moon, the engineers are switching the gas engine for an electric engine. And uh, without it stopping, without doing a pit stop, without um, uh, 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 preventing people from uh, continuing these transactions. So it's a very risky endeavor, which is why it's taken so many years to figure out what technology they think is actually better in the future and how to actually do this transition without causing $200 billion in value from crumbling. So uh, lots of engineering challenges, and um, it's, it's really a, a testament to the, the engineers that have put uh, years behind making this a reality. And um, we've, we've seen many delays, I would prefer to have those delays than try and jump in and make this, push this through without foreseeing issues, without testing. And so uh, what's, what's really happening is uh, a shift in how um, two different systems are used in Ethereum. And so the one system, is what's called the execution layer. And that is being separated from the consensus layer. So the execution layer is what you might have heard of recently as an EVM, uh, a virtual machine. And this is where the applications run. This is where the smart contracts execute. So when you buy a 
um, an asset using Uniswap, so you're using a decentralized exchange, you're using the smart contracts, Uniswap smart contracts, that's the execution layer. And previously, the um, Ethereum clients that were uh, holding the, all the data in the Ethereum blockchain and um, updating the, the Ethereum ledger uh, were essentially bound with both the execution layer and the consensus layer in one. And so what's happening is a transition to uh, splitting those layers. So now you can have different software running the execution layer from the consensus layer. So um, they have what's called a client. So with the Bitcoin network, you have uh, a Bitcoin node, which is a client that you download. And you can, if you want to, you can download it into your computer if you have uh, a really large hard drive and that client will connect to other clients on the Bitcoin network and you are facilitating and supporting the Bitcoin network. Now for Bitcoin, there's only one software client really that um, most people interact with and use. But Ethereum, we're seeing uh, four different um, clients being used or that people can use, uh, choose to use to run the execution layer um, and a few that can run the consensus layer. And so there's an API in between that uh, talks to them now. Um, and so it's giving um, validators more choice, more software choice in terms of what they're using. So it is creating uh, some resilience in terms of the software being used to secure the Ethereum network. And that if there is a bug that gets introduced in one of those clients, validators can utilize one of the other clients um, with uh, minimizing the risk of there being a, uh, a network outage. And so this is a um, really tricky piece because what's, um, what's what, once, once you understand this, what's changing is the consensus layer. So um, that is the biggest change that's happening with this merge. And so uh, what's currently, the consensus layer that's, that's currently being used is called proof of work. And it is changing to a system called proof of stake. The benefits for this change, and this is uh, suggested benefits from community and people outside the Ethereum community is that the power consumption used to secure transactions on the Ethereum network will drop by over 99%. And that's, that's a major or substantial drop in the amount of energy. So we're seeing that it's, it's very much a, um, a, a push from people who care about um, energy waste or energy use that um, uh, this, this uh, helps support that. Um, in addition to that, uh, another big change is the inflation rate of Ethereum is, is changing substantially. So uh, the number of newly minted Ethereum on a daily basis is going to drop by 90%. Um, this will have a, a big impact on the uh, amount of Ethereum being sold on the market. Uh, right now, it's about $15 million, uh, 15 million US dollars a day in uh, newly minted Ethereum that uh, is estimated to be sold on the market. So 90% of that um, will disappear after the merge happens. Um, the other area, and I don't know exactly how valid this statement is, but uh, because um, I, I don't think it's really going to be 
as easy as what people are saying, but they're basically saying that users can validate the Ethereum network um, with less resources. So uh, in theory, this is true um, in that you do not need specialized mining equipment that you need to set up in an environment where you need to take into consideration how much energy you use, uh, things like heat, and using highly specialized computers. But uh, so they're saying really anyone can validate the Ethereum network. So all you need is a laptop. Um, but that's not entirely true because there's still disk space that is required to store data uh, that's on the blockchain. And that could increase substantially. Um, but with this change or transition to proof of stake, you can have that division of labor where somebody else can run the hardware that has the disk space and um, the high um, bandwidth to, um, so, so they can run the infrastructure and you as an end user with your laptop can stake uh, and use that pool or use that validator uh, node to secure the network. And so um, in some ways it will make it a lot easier for somebody uh, with Ethereum on their laptop to uh, stake and um, help secure the network. Um, is there a question, Julia? Yeah, Stephen, um, Jonathan would like to know, are you saying ETH will lose the race to other layer ones due to old tech or are all layer ones old tech and something new is coming along? Ah, so um, I would say uh, layer ones is, are definitely not old tech. Uh, what I would say is the current Ethereum network, uh, I'd say uh, would be considered old tech where after the merge, it is still considered a layer one, but this is the technology that everyone wants to build on and improve. So basically this, um, and, and not everyone, I'll, I'll go into that in, in a little bit, but um, I, I wouldn't really say that a layer ones are old tech because there's still problems that need to be solved uh, there's still work that needs to be done on layer ones. Um, and to have a layer two, you have to have a layer one. So you can't really, um, you know, so a layer one technology isn't going to disappear. It's not going to go away. It is going to improve and, and continually improve uh, because we still don't know which layer ones we're going to use. Um, but layer twos are facilitating and, and helping that um that scalability uh, and with ethereum uh with ethereum merge it's a little murky because of this concept of sharding um and there may not necessarily be a clear cut uh understanding of layer one versus layer two uh, but i'll go into that um once we talk about what's what's happening after the merge are there any other questions Okay, so um, proof of work versus proof of stake. They both have a place in the current environment. Uh, if you are a proof of stake or, or proof of work maxi, I think uh, you will be uh, really disappointed long-term because we just don't know uh, what's going to work long-term. I don't think that we can decide today know that proof of stake is the future or proof of work uh, or a world without proof of work is what we need. Um, proof of work has already proved itself and proof of stake creates a lot more vulnerabilities that need to be resolved. And this is why it has taken Ethereum so long to um, to transition. Uh, initially, there was going to be, the reason why it was partly called Ethereum 2.0 was because they were going to keep the Ethereum um, proof of work uh, chain. 
um, now they are no longer uh, considering that. And so, um, so, so based on that, they, the engineers are comfortable enough to think that proof of stake is secure enough, probabilistically secure enough to secure transactions in the short term, in the near term. And I believe that from, from a probability perspective, they are likely right. So um, it's, it's unlikely that you will be able to counterfeit a transaction, duplicate ETH. You know, if you have one ETH in your wallet, you can't send one ETH to Joe and one ETH to Paul, and now you've created two ETH um, currently. But it is uh, a lot harder to um, account for all the attack vectors because uh, you're transitioning to a system where it's kind of like whack-a-mole. Now there are a lot more, um, you're opening up the um, opportunities to attack the network. And now you have to consider all of them and make sure that uh, they all work together to prevent gaming the system. And so um, this is where you know, the, the there's been numerous delays uh, on the Ethereum upgrade and it's to work out all the different uh, possible attack vectors, uh, test it, try and attack it, uh, and see what happens. And so um, the way I like to think about it is positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement. Uh, where proof of work, you get um, rewarded for doing work, doing good work. Uh, if you don't do good work, you're not rewarded. Whereas proof of stake, you're providing collateral. And if you are doing, if you're lying to the network, you can lose your collateral. So uh, you're not gonna lose 100% of it unless you consistently lie. There's a new system called slashing. Basically, people can be punished for manipulating or lying about transactions. So if you try and duplicate ETH uh, on the network, you have uh, Ethereum that you've staked, uh, you'll be punished. You will lose a portion of your stake. And um, there are a couple of other scenarios where you can lose your stake. Uh, for example, if, if you um, have some downtime, um, so you're meant to process a block and your validator goes down. Um, so uh, I think there's some leeway uh, to account for um, if, if your uh, you know, network briefly goes down, something like that. But if you're doing it consistently or maliciously, then you can lose a portion of your stake. And so um, you're punished for bad behavior. And so um, what's happened is uh, with this merge is in uh, 2020, the uh, step phase one uh, happened. So the um, the the uh, uh, proof of stake chain has been running for over two years now. Uh, I believe it was December 2020, so nearly two years, and uh, that enabled a separate parallel. Proof of, chain, uh, proof of stake chain to run alongside uh, the current Ethereum production environment. It doesn't um, execute any, um, uh, it, it doesn't execute transactions on that network. It was merely a system that was set up so that uh, it could be tested. So it's had over a year and a half uh, almost two years of testing. And um, some of the tests ha have been very valuable. You know, a couple of things have failed, but that's good. That's what we want to see. So we uh, know um, what's going, what we can expect uh, in the next month. This enabled, um, and, and the other area enabled um, people to start staking and validating uh, the proof of stake network. And oh, so over the last year and a half, 
There have been 40,000 validators added to the network. 13 million ETH has been staked and uh, requires uh, a substantial amount. Uh, well, today it's considered a substantial amount of ETH, 32 ETH to be a validator. And so this, this has enabled the network uh, security to, um, to build up over the last two years so that there's a substantial amount of confidence when the merge actually happens. So phase one so far has been a success. There have been uh, some delays. Some of those delays have been due to um, concerns around the clients that are managing uh, the execution layer versus the consensus layer, making sure that there's enough um, that there's enough decentralization um, amongst the users using the different clients. So different. Uh, so so not everyone's using the same software. Uh, there's been a split in the the different clients or software that people are using. And so uh, step two. This is in roughly 19 days. And unlike previous Ethereum hard forks, which relied on a specific block height, uh, so you would say, okay, on a specific block, the network will upgrade to um, the new uh, protocol. With the merge, it's based on the amount of proof of work that is being done. So once there's been enough proof of work, uh, um, aggregated on the network, the difficulty to uh, resolve a block is uh, hit. And when that target um, is hit, the nodes on the network will switch to the new beacon consensus stake model. Uh, it's estimated to be in 19 days, but it's an estimate. Um, they, uh, it really will depend on uh, whether this difficulty target is hit. So uh, what to expect? Well, in theory, if it works well, you shouldn't have, you, you shouldn't notice anything. The uh, average block time will be reduced from an average of 13 seconds to a guaranteed 12 seconds. So because it's proof of work, it's always an average. And so a, a block might be found in one second, a block might be found in 25 seconds. It averages to 13 seconds. With this change, the, um, it is known that there will be a new block every 12 seconds. Uh, it is, there is possibility for a block to be missed, um, for uh, uh, a validator to go down, and so, so that block is um, uh, um, missed, but uh, it's expected that every 12 seconds, there'll be a new block. Uh, you won't really notice this as an end user. So it's not really gonna have uh, a big impact. Um, transactions will get uh, verified slightly faster, but I think from a human perspective, we're not gonna really notice. Um, it's, the, the merge has been tested on other uh, Ethereum test networks. And from those tests, there have been no downtime. So you should not expect any noticeable differences or changes. Uh, if you are transition, uh, if you're sending some ETH to Uniswap to buy another token and uh, during the merge, um, you're not really going to notice, and you're going to get that token uh, if the next block is after the merge. Um, that's uh, that execution layer is going to be unaffected. So the assets, same thing. Uh, you're not going to notice any difference with the assets on um, the Ethereum network. So if you're holding uh, a token like Sushi um, before the merge you're still gonna have the same number of tokens uh, after the merge. You have an NFT, the NFT is gonna be there. Um, well, they say that they're, the proof of um, work chain is, um, is, is, is gonna be 
transitioning or merging to the proof of stake and the community that supports Ethereum will no longer be supporting the Ethereum proof of work. So in, that really means that the proof of work chain uh, is meant to die. Uh, it means it's meant to no longer exist after the merge. However, that's not going to be the case. There, um, and, and a part of the reason why are miners, uh, miners that have all this, um, they've spent billions of dollars on this um, computer hardware. Um, those miners are uh, not going to know what to do with their computer hardware. So some of them will go mine other chains like Ethereum Classic, but uh, a number of miners have signaled that they will be supporting a, uh, another Ethereum chain after the merge. So the, and, and that's not just the miners, uh, wallet providers and exchanges have also signaled that they will be supporting the Ethereum proof of work chain. So um, some exchanges have already uh, added the asset or added support for this asset and they call it ETH POW. So if you have a CryptoPunk before the merge, you're gonna have a CryptoPunk on the uh, beacon or proof of stake network and you're gonna have a, a CryptoPunk on the Ethereum proof of work network. However, because the majority of the Ethereum uh, ecosystem is supporting the new technology, the new uh, proof of stake consensus system, uh, and that includes entities like uh, OpenSea, Uniswap, the majority of the value will be on the proof of stake network. Um, so although you, you kind of have two NFTs, one is going to have the majority of the value. The other one might have no value or little value. And it really um, will take time to see where that goes. Um, that ETH proof of work might die days, weeks, months, years after, or it might be resilient and stay around for a while. We just don't know. But what we do know is that the majority of developers, the majority of the Ethereum community and network are not supporting the old proof of work uh, network. They are and will be providing development and support for the new network. And so, uh, although there will be two chains, um, there, there's going to be really one that has the support of the community, uh, whereas the other one is to be determined. Uh, we have another question just from James. Yeah. Stephen, if there is a ETH proof of work that hard forks off, how can I ensure I receive this? Will my ETH stored on Dasset have the ETH power of, uh, proof of work airdropped to my account? Ah, great question. So um, we are working with Bitrex on this and uh, they have signaled that they will be providing support for this. Um, one thing uh, about Bitrex is um, they are a little bit slower in rolling out uh, some of this support. Uh, so um, we do expect to uh, provide support for the ETH proof of work um, network if that, um, uh, comes to fruition. You know, it's, it's really, this is where it's really hard to say. Uh, the day after the merge, miners, entities who s signaled that they would support it might say, oh, we'll no longer support it. So um, there's nothing there after that. But if there is um, a desire from those entities who want to support the fork, um, and there is um, uh, support for it, and uh, then, then we will support it as well. So um, yeah, so expect updates uh, coming from Dasset um, before and after the merge regarding 
uh, what's happening with the Ethereum proof of work. Uh, now, you don't really have to worry about um, withdrawing it to something like MetaMask because um, if you use something like your, your uh, MetaMask wallet where you have the same ETH address, that address will work on both chains. Uh, your, your private key, um, which is essentially the keys to the kingdom, your signature uh, will work on both networks. Uh, you may have to add uh, support for the proof of work network because MetaMask as a um, wallet provider uh, has signaled that they will be providing support for the new merged beacon chain network. So uh, you might have to add some customizations to support the, what is uh, still to be determined in terms of name, but the ETH POW network. Now, things like stable coins, um, although you'll have a stable coin on both networks, the stable coin uh, issuers are only supporting the stable coins on the, the upgraded uh, or the merged network. So you might have USDC on POW, but um, that's not really going to be recognized or redeemable. Uh, what's going to be recognized and redeemable are the um, USDC tokens on uh, the, the proof of stake chain. Great. Uh, also, James would like to know any idea why the merge is based on the cum cumulative difficulty target instead of block height? And uh, are, there, are there other layer one running proof of stake? What are the advantages of ETH post merge versus example Solana? Yep. So um, there, there are a few proof of stake networks out there, uh, which Cardano is one of them. Um, and the uh, so, so yeah. So um, there, there's certainly some that are out there that exist today, and they uh, range from entities like Zilliqa, uh, Binance Smart Chain, and um, you know, some of them have sh kind of shown us what um, what could happen with lower fees and a higher transaction throughput because they're trading um, the, the, the trade off for that scale, uh, throughput is centralization. So there's way less validators uh, on some of those networks that can um, shove a lot more transactions through. Um, Sorry, what was the first part of that question? Any idea where why the merge is based on ah, yes. cumulative difficulty yeah, yeah. target? Yeah, so um, the, the main purpose there was to prevent gaming the system. So um, they, uh, you never know uh, if, if miners would attempt to attack the network, but they, um, wanted to prevent uh, an attack on the network where uh, the, the um, they, that somehow um, continued the proof of work chain and um, confused the uh, nodes from um, using either proof of work or proof of stake. So it was a way to uh, prevent the gamification of um, attacking the network, essentially. Ah, so um, now, so uh, and we have a number of clients that uh, have over the last year and a half staked their ETH uh, through DASIT. And uh, some good news and bad news. The bad news is that this uh, upcoming merge in 19 days will not enable us to unstake that Ethereum. So um, the Ethereum is still locked in the um, smart contracts for uh, validating the beacon chain. And there's no clear um, time frame on when that will change. It's going to require a, a hard fork after the merge, 
and they don't know uh, which hard fork or um, when specifically, but they estimate it's going to be about six months, uh, six to 12 months um, before uh, users will be able to unstake their ETH in the validator node. Now, right now, um, the uh, yield has, has dropped uh, dramatically from the increase in uh, validators and staked ETH. But that um, reward comes from inflated or newly minted Ethereum, and uh, they haven't really been rewarded for transaction fees. So it is expected that there will be an increase in yield after the transition, which will come from the uh, what used to be the transaction fees. And so those transaction fees will go to these um, to the uh, Ethereum validators. And so uh, there is a possibility. Uh, it is estimated that the yield uh, will be somewhere in the range of six to ten percent. I believe right now it's, it's something like three and a half to four uh, percent. But it's really going to come down to how many people are staking and how much of the network is being used at any given time. And so, um, so yeah, so, so there's some good, there's some bad. Uh, and I wouldn't really say it's bad. It's just uh, we don't have a specific time on, on when uh, we'll be able to unstake this ETH, but we're getting closer and closer to that. Um, Richard would like to ask a question, Stephen. Yes. So the success, the success of an ETH fork will require not only users, capital and development work, but also strong support from existing blockchain infra infrastructure. Do you think a large number of miners will simply switch to mining ETC rather than ETFW? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. And um, it's, it's hard to say. So uh, I think miners will go in many different directions. Uh, I'd say, the majority, and this I'm just spitballing numbers, but I would expect something like 80% of the miners are going to go, uh, may, maybe 60 to 80% are going to pick Ethereum POW, ETH POW, or Ethereum Classic, and um, the remaining will split and go to other chains. Um, and uh, I don't know. Uh, it's it's really going to be down to the community and the um, the vested interests of those individuals. the The one thing that is is a bit challenging around Ethereum Classic it is it is very much driven personality driven uh, and it, and I mean you can say that about Ethereum. You know Ethereum's personality driven by uh, people rallying behind Vitalik, but Ethereum is very much, very uh, a lot more decentralized, I'd say, than than I think people give it credit. Whereas Ethereum Classic is very much a uh, um, supported by uh, one one entity um, and uh, that's uh, DCG, and so um, it's not really uh, saying anything bad about DCG, but it's it's uh, you know we don't really want chains that have um, cult leaders or cult um, entities that are, are backing it. I'm not saying by any means that, that DCG is a, a cult following or uh, anything like that uh, by any means. But uh, wh what I mean by that is um, we want a lot of players in the market supporting these networks. We don't want one entity uh, or one person um, to be the face of that network. Uh, we, we do want many different market participants. And so um, it'll be up to the, yeah, the, the infrastructure and those are the wallet providers, the exchanges, the uh, miners and the developers uh, to and the community to decide whether they're gonna support proof of work, Ethereum Classic and um, how much support. Uh, could be where majority of the support goes to Ethereum uh, ETH POW and Ethereum Classic 
um, just doesn't get that get that um, support. But we, this is just a guessing game, really, at the end of the day. And I don't think anyone can give you a specific answer. Um, so here are some big myths, and it's going to be really disappointing for any NFT DGENs or anyone who uh, does a lot of transactions on Ethereum. Uh, this upgrade or this merge is not going to improve Ethereum scalability. It's also not going to reduce the transaction fees. So the thing that everything everyone's been complaining about um, is not going to be solved uh, next month by any means. Um, but the merge is enabling the uh, the the next phase of development to enable both scalability and reduction of fees. And so uh, that is uh, uh, bringing on new technology that people are looking at sharding. Um, sharding, but you know this sharding's been talked about since 2018, uh, maybe even before that. But it's still very theoretical in terms of how it's going to be applied to Ethereum. People are still, um, so people are um, laser focused on what's happening in the merge in the next month. And by people, I mean engineers. Some are looking ahead, looking at solutions ahead, but uh, I think it's gonna take this merge to happen before um, a lot of resources are put to the next phase of uh, um, technological uh, development for Ethereum. And who knows, it could be called something, you know, it's, it's had very many different names. Different networks call them different things. Uh, you know, subnet, sidechain, uh, shard. Um, the language is still evolving and the technology is still evolving. And so the idea was uh, that there's going to be 64 different shards of Ethereum, uh, which will require um, uh, something like 9 million, at least a minimum of 9 million ETH state, roughly. And by having these different shards, that means uh, they can be used for specific purposes, they're more regionalized, um, more localized. And so um, it enables a high transaction throughput through one of these shards. But then you have to make sure that the underlying network is still validating uh, transactions and securing them. If I send ETH uh, on this shard, uh, you want to make sure that I'm not gaming the system and trying to send ETH on that shard as well and uh, doubling my ETH. So I think there's still some, some major technical challenges that have not been solved yet. And so this is where there's opportunity. Um, there's a huge shortage of engineers and developers in our industry. And uh, we don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. Um, and so this, this creates the opportunity to uh, explore, review, and, and try and uh, help test and uh, a lot of times fail to see what's, what we can uh, come up with. And so um, this is really the idea is that um, after this merge, uh, we can turn our resources and attention towards uh, improving scalability. So having 64 shards, you know, uh, well, with each shard kind of being considered a layer two, um, or its own layer in some ways, uh, people are still working out exactly uh, what to expect. However, um, with what's what's being accomplished, uh, there's um, a few different directions that the network can go in for scalability. And that's really exciting because we're not going to have it this year, we're not gonna have it next year, but in the next four to five years, we'll be able to have billions of users utilizing this technology through their uh, daily activity. And uh, we won't be able to get to that magnitude and that scale 
uh, without uh, things like what's happening with the merge with Ethereum today. Uh, Stephen James would like to know, do you think the merge will be bullish? <laughs> uh, we all that's hope, a great right? Question. We all hope. Um, I think that's already priced in. We've seen a 90% or a 100% uh, increase in the price of Ethereum uh, going from a um, thousand US dollars to 2000 US dollars. We've seen a pullback recently. Um, we see that CME, so um, the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, it looks like they are launching a futures project product for Ethereum uh, in September. <laughs> Historically, that has been uh, bearish um, in that uh, they, they usually launch products like that um, at the top of a market. But um, the, I think the, the things that we can look at is the 90% reduction in newly minted uh, ETH. So 90% of sell, um, sell pressure from, from those um, that minted coins, newly minted coins is gone. Uh, that's gonna create, um, uh, that could create a supply shock. Um, if the merge is successful, it uh, will certainly be very bullish over the next few years. It's not like we're going to see, I mean, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, so it could happen. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to see a 10, 20, 30% increase in the price the day after. Um, but all intents and purposes, uh, it's successful. Um, that will be priced in and um, that will uh be be really exciting more so for the i'd say the developers and users of ethereum than the price of ethereum because this enables developers to build applications that um can have a billion users two billion users and so from that perspective um very bullish for the technology uh that is if proof of stake is the direction we should go in. So the nice thing about this is if we're able to do this and we've, uh, we're splitting the consensus system and it's determined that proof of stake is not really the way that the uh, network should go, it's possible that we can incorporate or merge a proof of work consensus system down the road. So. Um, you know, I think my, my personal belief, this is not the belief of Dasset. Um, I, I, I personally think that a, um, a successful solution that will be found, uh, over the next 10 years will be some form of hybrid proof of work, proof of stake solution, where the proof of stake facilitates that, um, centralized uh high transaction throughput where proof of work still manages the security layer and so um to be determined we'll see we'll see what happens but uh proof of work has proven itself proof of stake has not and we've seen with some other networks like solana uh that the whole network can freeze and so a, a bug can be introduced. I, I think one of the, the benefits with the Ethereum proof of um, stake net network that's going in is that there's going to be multiple so uh, software clients, so if the, uh, which is really uh, good because if one of them introduces a bug, there's three others that uh, the infrastructure um, can pick up and use. And so um, that, that will... I think reduce the risk of the network freezing. Um, so this is where it's a bit tricky, you know, two hundred billion dollar network, and we're moving it to this um, untested consensus mechanism. I mean, people, you can say that proof of stake has been tested for the last uh, eight years uh, on other chains uh, and chains that are running right now. Um, 
but I think there's some um, mechanisms that are unaccounted for that could impact the network uh, in the future. So something else to be wary of, and this is um, people are still hypothesizing, you know, how can you compromise the network where this isn't compromising the Ethereum network by any means, but uh, there um, have been some hypothesized attacks on the network uh, where one of them is called the replay attack. And so if you have a valuable NFT on both networks and you sell it on one network um, for a very, very low price, somebody could potentially use that transaction with the signature and um, run that transaction on the other network and acquire your very expensive NFT for the same price that you sold it on the uh, less supported network. Uh, so um, it is recommended to uh, potentially delist your NFTs if you're super concerned or just watch what you're listing it for on something like OpenSea. Um, but I think these things are going to be pretty low risk and we'll hear about them very quickly after the merge. Exciting times and great opportunity to join in the, uh, in the industry and, and see what's, um, you know, where, where it's going because the next phase is, is going to be mass adoption. So uh, really great to have everyone here for the journey.